Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Time to wake up and understand a little bit more about uh, sleep and how it impacts health. When we think about wellness, we think about three things. One is sleep, second is eating, and third is exercise. Sleep, eat, exercise, and you can be much more healthy. And there's a lot of emphasis from World Health Organization on what is called non-communicable diseases. And when we think about it, things that come to our mind are, anybody can talk about a non-communicable disease that we are all worried about? Cardiac, Cardiac. Diabetes. diabetes, hypertension, obesity. obesity, and guess what links all of them? Sleep problems. Okay, there's more and more evidence that sleep problems, in fact, impact blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. So that's what we are going to talk about in the next few minutes. And before I start, I wanted to just ask three questions to the audience. Number one, how many of you know that there are sleep specialists before you signed up for this program? That's better than usual. Okay, good. I think it's, it was almost about 30% of the audience. Usually it's much, much less than that. Number two, how many of you here think four hours of sleep is good enough for you? Raise your hands, please. Sure, four hours of sleep you think is good enough, few of you. Five. Five hours, how many of you think is enough? Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. <laughs> ten. Twenty-four. <laughs> no. Okay. You know what? I've done this to several groups of audience, and the response is always like this. Most of you will be in the range of six to eight, but there will always be some who say four hours is good enough. There will always be someone who will, you know, make others laugh with a nine. But that's true. That's what he or she needs. That's what we need to talk about. There has been more and more awareness about sleep, thanks to the media. Okay, we see more and more understanding about sleep problems. Indians are sleeping less. Okay. And guess what? Our celebrities love sleeping. There are pictures of ministers sleeping, prime ministers sleeping, presidents sleeping. You've all seen it, right? Which is true. It's probably because they have an underlying sleep problem which has not been treated. Yes, stress, but that is a factor leading to their sleep problem which is what needs to be addressed. So I was just mentioning about how many hours is good enough. If I had asked the same question in 1910 when I wasn't born, the answer would have been around nine hours. That's what the world was sleeping in the early 1900s. Okay? As you move forward, you see you know, we are shrinking our sleep time. As our lifestyle has changed, we've been shrinking our sleep time more and more, which is why today the majority of you said six hours to six and a half hours because we've learned to live with that kind of a sleep hours. We are not able to shrink our work hours. What's worse, the commute to work has increased. I mean, as the cities are expanding, a lot of you tra probably travel one to one and a half hours to go to work and return to work, and that has stretched our hours. More importantly, no longer are we free from work when we come home, thanks to a wonderful gadget we all have, right? We have the phone right next to us, keeps waking us up several times. There are so many people who come to me saying, I have to get up and check the phone a few times in the night. I have to check Facebook, I have to check you know, WhatsApp, whatever it is, and that's what is distracting more and more people from sleeping well. So as a sleep doctor, what kind of complaints do I see and how does it impact you as people who are managing other people? You know, those of you who are in HR, how is it going to impact your productivity and it was interesting when I was having a conversation in uh, during lunch you were talking about presenteeism rather than absenteeism think of people who are at work who are actually not working you know that's not the kind of workforce you want and what could that be due to number one insomnia okay people who just say I cannot sleep okay that's the largest group the second one are the people who feel sleepy a lot. They are excessively sleepy during the daytime, 
And guess what? They will never admit that they have a sleep problem because they say, I have no problem with sleep. I can sleep during work. I can sleep during driving. I can sleep during whatever. So I don't have a sleep problem. And those are the ones who actually have a bigger sleep problem impacting your productivity, their productivity, and probably not the kind of person I want to be driving around with. Okay, so exactly a bigger problem which we'll talk about. The third group are those who have fragmented sleep. They go to bed on time, they wake up on time, or probably not on time. We'll talk about the shift work disorders as well. But during this period, they wake up several times. So they have a fragmented sleep. And we will talk about each one of these a little bit. Now, in our own center, the largest group we see is probably those with sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea. I will talk a little bit more in detail about that because that can have a significant impact on productivity. The second larger group are the insomniacs, those who don't sleep or don't feel that they are sleeping enough. We do have people coming to us with what is called circadian rhythm disturbance. Think of somebody who is always jet lagged. That's what circadian rhythm disturbance is. They either sleep late, wake up late, or they are, because of their shift work, have to sleep at times when their body is not allowing them to sleep. All of these are another chunk. And of course, we also see those who sleep walk, sleep talk, sleep eat, any of the other disorders that can happen during sleep. Now, this is really interesting, what we did in our own uh, center. We looked at 1,000 consecutive patients who presented to our sleep center. And we just asked them, who referred you? Is it a doctor or did you come by yourself? Guess what? 42% of the patients were referred by other doctors. Most of them were coming on their own, okay? Uh, whatever be the reason. But it is, in fact, a success to the media that's creating awareness, success to Google and several other tools that we have where we can get information, good, right, wrong, bad, doesn't matter, but you have information. And therefore, people come over earlier. But it's unfortunate that even our own doctors don't ask about sleep problem when you go for any other checkup. I mean, you go to a doctor for diabetes, he'll ask you, you know, do you have neuropathy symptoms? Do you have any problem with your hands, legs, any of How many of them even ask you, are you sleeping adequately? Fully understanding that that's probably going to impact your blood sugar control or your blood pressure control. But amongst this group, we found that those with snoring and sleep apnea, the referral was slightly higher than those who were um, insomniacs. And that's just a summary of that without going into detail. Now, what does this do? So what if you don't sleep? Or so what if you don't sleep enough? Imagine one night that you're not sleeping adequately. How do you feel the next day? You wake up with a headache, or you feel that your eyes are red, watering, you feel irritable, you feel like you're not functioning well, you feel like you can't focus adequately, you feel like just not wanting to work that day, right? Just one night of lack of sleep, which I'm sure all of us had for some reason or the other. It could have been a function at home, it could have watched a night show, movie, or any of those. All of us would have had at least one night when we didn't sleep adequately, and that's how we feel the next day. Now, multiply this by several days. How do you feel people would feel if they are not getting enough sleep? They accumulate what is called sleep debt. And you cannot catch up over the weekend. That's a wrong thing people feel, saying that let me sleep four or five hours during the weekdays, and I'll sleep 12 hours during the weekend. Does not work. That's not how our system is tuned to you know, like function better. So anybody who does not sleep adequately for several days or months or years, which you know, there are several of them, can have memory problem, can have mood disturbances, can feel depressed, can feel anxious, and may end up with all the different specialists before they actually address their sleep problem. They go with headaches to neurologists, they complain of fatigue and go to neurologists, they, you know, like feel depressed, feel anxious, go to psychiatrists, already develop blood pressure and diabetes and see general physicians, but they don't address their underlying sleep problem, which is, in fact, extremely common. So it's truly a public health concern that we are all getting sleep deprived. Not just adults, our school children as well, right from their adolescent age, you know, I mean, I have children who are in that age, certainly not my poster kids for sleep problems because they also sleep at wrong hours. That's exactly what they do. They sleep late, 
you know, like try to wake up early because they have so much to catch up with. There's a lot of peer pressure. The number of hours that an adolescent needs is more than what an adult needs. They need about eight to nine hours, but I can't think of a single child in our school system that probably gets it regularly. They may get it on some days, but not consistently. More importantly, these sleepiness because of lack of sleep can lead to industrial errors and accidents. There's a lot of debate on whether, you know, the Bhopal tragedy, the Exxon tragedy were all related to somebody who was sleepy. Even today, every day we read in the newspapers that there was a truck accident or a road accident where the, uh, you know, driver slept on the wheels and we just read it and pass, not realizing that this is in fact an error or a problem that the public has to address and it is a public health issue. There are countries like the US where when you go for your driving license, just like how they ask you here about hypertension, diabetes and seizures, sleep disorders are included. Because if you have sleep apnea and if you are feeling sleepy, you are a risk on the road and your license is actually held, particularly if you have to hold heavy vehicle license. And we are nowhere near there and hopefully we'll get there sometime soon. And it can certainly lead to other disasters in the workplace which we need to think about. Okay, moving on from insomnia to excessive sleepiness. And as I mentioned, this is an extremely common problem and for those of you who have read the book, uh, Charles Dickens' Pickwick in papers, uh, pick, uh, you remember how Pickwick was. The big fat Joe sitting there, sleeping, waking up, eating, sleeping, waking up, and nothing else. Why? He probably had this problem, what he call obstructive sleep apnea. Now, what is this? Now, imagine when we are lying down and sleeping, as we go into deeper sleep, all our body muscles are relaxing. And when the muscles relax, there are muscles around the breathing pipe which also kind of collapse. So what happens, it happens to everyone, but there are some people in whom it happens more. What it does is, imagine a small pipe and you're <laughs> blowing through that. You make a noise. So that noise is snoring, okay? People used to laugh about snoring, not realizing that it's a medical problem. Imagine the pipe is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> the noise is going to become louder and louder and louder until the pipe closes fully, and when the pipe closes fully, suddenly you stop breathing, okay? And when you stop breathing, your brain gives you a signal saying that you're not breathing adequately, you wake up and you go, <coughs> and you just wake up, okay? Now, people who snore never realize that they are snoring. It's the bed partner who observes, and they always tell them, actually, I'm okay when he snores, he or she snores. But when they don't snore, I'm worried because I know you stop breathing. Okay, and sometimes they just fall off the bed, they just jerk, and all of these are symptoms of what we call sleep apnea. So the commonest symptom is snoring, but they often complain saying that I feel like I'm choking, I wake up, my throat is very dry because they are mouth breathing. Okay, so they say that mouth, throat is very dry, but the commonest thing they say is I wake up in the night going to the bathroom, all of this happens, but I sleep for eight hours, but when I wake up, I do not feel fresh. Okay, what we classically call non-refreshing sleep. So they wake up after six hours, seven hours, eight hours, whatever they sleep, but they don't wake up feeling fresh. They have a headache. Throughout the day, they say that any dull moment, you know, if the lights are dim and there's a PowerPoint presentation, they doze off. Okay, I don't see anyone here so far. Okay, so that's one. They, whenever they're sitting, they might doze off. Whenever they are at work, they may doze off. And what is even worse, even when they have to concentrate, like when they are driving, they may doze off, which is a threat to them and the people who are driving around them. So motor vehicle crashes, work-related accidents, performance being low, whether it's at school or at work, are all very, very common. It at, gets to a point where it can be a social embarrassment. There are a lot of marital problems that come with it. Okay. There are people who come and tell me we don't sleep together because he snores or she snores or whatever it is. And that is an ongoing issue and it can have other uh, impact as well on uh, sexuality and all of that. And that can be an issue. A lot of them can develop concentration problems, memory issues, and as was earlier mentioned, anxiety, depression. All of these because the oxygen level in the body is low for a long, long time. Every night when they are breathing is affected, their oxygen level is low, and that's the reason they develop all of these problems. Now, who develops this? Slightly more common in men, but women can also have it. 
obesity is clearly known to be associated and that's why i was saying that you know they are all linked to sleep problems obese people are more likely to have sleep apnea that does not mean that lean people won't get it and in particular in india we find lot of non obese patients having sleep apnea may be related to our facial structures may be related to the, you know central obesity in men all of these could be causing it but certainly something to think about anatomical abnormality i was just telling you about the jaw structure and stuff some medications alcohol and smoking are clearly known to be associated with snoring and sleep apnea in fact people who snore those who have been observed they'll always say on the night that he or she consumes alcohol the chances of snoring is even more okay so it's very well known to happen more importantly as i said 60% of the patients with sleep apnea have blood pressure 40% of patients with blood pressure have sleep apnea and particularly if somebody has what we call resistant hypertension if their blood pressure is not controlled with two medications or more that means you need to think about do they have underlying sleep apnea and the same thing is true for diabetes and we have uh, published a lot uh, in collaboration with another diabetic institute mv diabetes on how much you know diabetes and sleeplessness and sleep apnea are very very closely linked lot of people when their sugar is not controlled when we treat their sleep problem their you know blood sugar is much much better controlled same thing with heart diseases it's been show, shown that if you snore and don't have any other risk for you know heart disease like you don't have blood pressure you don't have diabetes you're not a smoker you don't have high cholesterol but you snore then your risk of heart disease is much more than somebody who doesn't snore or does not have sleep apnea so clearly known to be linked with all of the uh, non communicable disease that we mentioned when we talked about so so what i mean if you have sleep apnea how do you treat it i'm not going into the details it's not a medical talk but uh, this is one of those conditions where there are no tablets to cure that's one thing i just wanted to mention you there are i mean losing weight treating the underlying thyroid problem all of that help but there are some appliances and stuff you may have to use but before we do that we you know what we do is we check whether they have the sleep problem and how severe it is and for that we may need to do what is called a sleep study there are different types of sleep study again not to get into the details some of them are portable and can be done at home or anywhere but for certain details we may need to get the test done only in the sleep lab there's something called cpap which we use for people who have snoring and sleep apnea where what it does is it's not oxygen but it just blows pressure and it helps to keep your pipe open so they don't snore more importantly they rest better and their functionality improves significantly they are completely different human beings after they are being treated though somebody who was sleeping in my waiting room after using cpap when he comes he says you know i feel like a different person their productivity improves uh, you know so many other things their blood pressure control diabetes control all of that can significantly improve lastly fragmented sleep those who wake up several times as i said anything when you break it into pieces is useless right and that's exactly what happens to sleep i mean you if you don't sleep continuously and you're waking up several times it's not going to give you the same effect as sleeping continuously and the commonest reasons are other medical problems if somebody has blood sugar and it's not controlled they're going to wake up to go to the bathroom often so that can disturb their sleep men having prostate problems if it's not under control again may wake up several times asthma lung disease all of those but i want to mention specifically about shift work syndrome okay which is very common uh, more and more these days i mean i've done shift works as a doctor you know nurses do it healthcare professionals do it all the time factory workers have done it for you know uh, age immemorial but why is it different now why is the shift work syndrome now very different it's primarily because when we all did our shift work a lot of the times and again when I, you know there may be exceptions a lot of the times we rotated shifts okay we did some day shifts some night shifts some afternoon shifts today when people are working the uk time or the us time or the australian time or whatever other time theoretically they are jet lagged because they are awake during the time when some other country is awake and they are trying to sleep at a time when your own country is sleeping okay and this leads to a lot of other deprivations imagine somebody who is working only like let's say 3 pm to 2 am and comes home at 4 o'clock and sleeps in the morning 
he already has several challenges because the body has a propensity to sleep when there is darkness around you. He, ha he or she has to now sleep when there is sunlight around them. More importantly, their affectionate mother will wake them up halfway through their sleep to give lunch because that's when the rest of the world is eating lunch but they don't get continuous sleep and that gets interrupted. So there are a lot of little changes that they have to make in their life but more importantly what happens is they are at work when others are sleeping and they are trying to sleep when others are at work and they lose out on social life and this seems to have an impact in their you know, performance level, in their anxiety, depression, all of those. Very, very unfortunately, I see several people who are very young who come with so-called anxiety, depression, had enough with life and uh, it was very unfortunate to hear from the previous speaker about that as well. And they try to avoid seeing a psychiatrist, they come to me as, you know, addressing their sleep problems, end up, you know, probably having depression which needs to be treated. And I find that this uh, sense of, I don't have anything more in life to do, creeps up very early these days in 30s, certainly in the 40s for a lot of people. So they feel like they've had everything that they wanted to, nothing more new or anything to achieve. And that has led to several psychosocial problems that you know, our society is facing today. I just wanted to close with one interesting thing that I found in a patient with shift work syndrome. So this was a person who was re working regular day shifts and then you know, like, uh, had to move to a shift which he could not cope with. He could not sleep in the daytime. So he came to me and then we said, okay, what we will do is like, we will teach you certain techniques, you know, put dark curtains, make the rooms dark, tell your uh, mother, you know, not to wake you up in between. Remember that when everybody is eating breakfast, that's actually your dinner, okay? And when you are leaving to work in the evening, everybody is eating dinner, which is your breakfast. So we had to ta teach him all of that, reorient him, and he couldn't sleep. So then we said, okay, you know, like what else can be done? We had to give him some medications, didn't work, you know, something called melatonin, which we try to use to regulate the cycle. None of those worked. And then finally I asked him, so what do you do before taking up this shift job that you used to do before you go to sleep? And he, he said that I used to watch the 10 p.m. news in a particular TV channel, okay? That was his trigger to sleep. So all we had to do is I told him, why don't you tell your wife to record that previous 10 p.m. night sleep. And guess what? He started sleeping really well. Okay. So we all have routines. We have routines that we like. Some people like their hand under their head. Some people like a pillow between their legs. Whatever it is, we need our routine. We need to unwind before we sleep. Today, most of us come from work, eat, ready to sleep because that's all the time we have. There is no time to unwind, no time to be with family, no time to be with... You know, whether it is TV watching or book reading, whatever it is, something other than work before you go to sleep can go a long way. Um, there are also other problems. I don't want to go into the details. I'll close there. Just wanted to reinforce that a good night is essential for a good day. So make sure that you all sleep well and that can certainly improve the productivity at work. Thank you all.